Stefano is one of the most known and I think important architects of a, I think a very innovative generation who want to, to think about new paradigms in, um, in an innovative architecture and in a progressive gaze to the cities. Uh, Stefano Boeri uh, is uh, uh, an architect of my generation. Huh? <laughs> uh, um, as you know, uh, he has a, an office, a Stefano Boeri architect in Milano. And uh, from uh, 2011 to, 2000, to, to today, practically, to 2013, has been counselor of, for culture, design, and fashion for the municipality of Milano. So, very important thing, a uh, very important uh, r responsibility in the city for culture and for uh, progress uh, in uh, design, fashion, and uh, projectual and diffusion of um, the creativity. From uh, 2004 to 2007, he was uh, editor-in-chief of Domus International Magazine, and uh, it was a fantastic uh, moment in, the, in this uh, magazine um, uh, that you know perfectly. And from uh, 2007 to 2011, he was editor-in-chief of the international magazine Abitare. In fact, one of the aspects that we have together uh, is uh, this, in common is this, um, uh, duality uh, between uh, architecture, uh, 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 projection of the city, and uh, diffusion. Not uh, uh, in a journalist way, but more in a projectual way to explain things. And uh, also, evidently, he's also a professor. Uh, he, he likes the educational. Um, activity and he's professor of urban design in the, at the Politecnico uh, di Milano and, ha, and also he has been uh, invited in a lot in a lot of um, schools but also evidently in Harvard in uh, uh, the MIT and also in the Berlag Institute uh, perhaps we are the most important but uh, usually he's always invited as a visitor in uh, professor he's uh, the founder of uh, Project was very important, uh, Multiplicity, International Research Network, dedicated to the study of contemporary urban transformation. And for this reason, I say that he's an architect, and he's an architect, as you, but also he's an architect interested in the transformations and evolutions of the city. And this is very important. I think it's very important to believe in the capacity as architects to try to orientate the city. Uh, he's a co-author of different volumes, for example, Mutation, the volume of Actar editions, uh, very important, but also use Cronache uh, uh, del Habitare, de Mondadori, uh, Bio Milano, eh, and Anticita, un uh, libro fantastico. Stefano Boeri, uh, with his texts and reflections, is a regular contributor to several magazines and newspapers, you can imagine. Eh? And uh, this is uh, very important, together with uh, Burdett, uh, Richie, uh, Ricky Burdett, uh, Erzog, and McDonald's, uh, Boeri was part of the Architectural Advi Advisory Co Board in terms of developing of the guidelines, the most important guidelines uh, uh, for the urban transformations in uh, 2015 in Milano Architecture Expo, and also is very involved in the transformations of Milano, and not only in Milano, but in a lot of cities uh, in the world. And thank yes, this is a finish. Exactly. Ostras, como las adivinado. Very good. Uh, thank you very much to be with us. And Stefano, and it's a pleasure. And very good. Good start. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Manuel, first of all, and I really honored happy to be here with you and uh, what I'd love to, to do in the next uh, uh, minutes is to show you uh, a sequence but first a sequence of images which in my opinion are representing better than for my words what uh, what um, what I have done in the last year it is true what Manuel was saying that uh, in a way <coughs> in the last years I was uh, in a certain of uh, 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 ambiguous condition in between politics and architecture and I think it's 
what I'll try to do uh, now is to uh, the, the more expertise I'd love to show you exactly what does it mean to be in between politics and architecture. Uh, from a certain point of view, uh, when you are working as an architect and you are interested to consider the social utility of your work, of your profession, of your career, you are in a political dimension. And at the same time, when you are working as a politician, and you are interested to consider the special effects, the material effects on the space of your actions, you are in an architectural dimension. But simply to tell you that the relation between these two spheres, architecture and politics, are uh, really complex, but at the same time, these two spheres are uh, quite close one to the other. But let's start. So uh, I have to say that I've been always obsessioned by, by dock architecture, by harbors, by, let me say, portal cities. And I worked a lot on the Mediterranean basin and in the portal cities in Genoa, in Trieste, in Naples, in Marseille, in Thessaloniki. And I was also trying to question myself what's the best way to intervene on the waterfront, on the edge of the city, in relation to the sea, in relation to the water. Uh, uh, for many reasons, I really think that the hairballs are a uh, dynamic part of our urban condition. Uh, uh, ports are always changing. Uh, ports are changing in relation with uh, facts which are happening a thousand of kilometers away from the, the place. Uh, ports are also a place where normally the relation between architecture and techniques is uh, normally extremely fertile. Uh, I started at the beginning of the 90s, working in a, for a project in a, in a, in, a, in Greece uh, for a new port where I was designing basic and infrastructure. Then uh, in 96, I was asked to design a, a temporary space in Naples, uh, close to the harbor. Then again, just to give you some example of what I've done. Uh, I was part of a competition for Ponte Parade in Guinea, que probably Manuel knows well. I did it with uh, Remkulas and OMA, and that in that case we were thinking to the possibility to create a hole in the center of Genoa port. And uh, this was a, a very important starting point for me just to understand that normally we are used to consider the edge of a port like a periphery. But uh, from another point of view, if we observe the relation between the sea and the key, the port is a central place because it uh, allows or it hosts flows coming from the water and flows coming from the, in this case, from the hills, from the, from the territory. And it's a crossing point of this flow. So it's a really central place. And the idea of this square was under the level of the water came to me in this case exactly because we wanted to create a public crucial central space in the core of Kino. Um, and that's another project that I had developed some years after the Ponte Parodi, always in Genoa, that's the idea of a football stadium who wants to detain uh, rocks in the, in the sea. And uh, well, I worked a lot on that, and that's a reason of, of part of, uh, of, uh, of a, a number of uh, unrealizable projects. Uh, this is something that we have done. And this is something that, from another point of view, it's a first example of a short circuit between politics and architecture. That's a project for the G8 summit, uh, 2009, 2009, that we hosted in, uh, in uh, north of Sardinia, Italy. Uh, we have worked in one year, uh, transforming the whole the, uh, army uh, harbor into a new maritime pole. And it was a, an amazing experience because we have worked at uh, compressing our time, our efforts, our designs, 
in order to be ready for, for, for the uh, June 2009. And uh, the Maddalena, which is an island on the north of Sardinia between the Sardinian course, is an amazing place. And in that case, the idea was really to transform and work on the idea of a legacy of the transformation. Because G8, like uh, other international events, are extremely important because normally they are capable to accelerate the economical dynamics. They are capable to put a place where the events happen on a, on a pedestal, on a mediatic pedestal. But uh, what is uh, always uh, uh, more important is to start to design the space for a big event knowing what could be the legacy for this. So what will stay, what will remain after the end of the event. In this case, we were from the beginning imagining that after that summit, which is a geopolitical summit, that place has become a, a maritime pole, which is absolutely important, necessary, but that's part of, of, of the continent. So I worked a lot uh, in that case on an idea of a building who was a building who should be should host the the, the summit the summit of the um, of the president of the eight main uh, countries uh, imagining a building and architecture who has to be a relation direct relation with the sea in this case I was working with a, a sort of suspended buildings which we had built. And uh, in this case, the relation is uh, very particular because uh, what I really wanted to, to realize is something which has a skin who has to be transparent, uh, at the same time who has to be a skin capable to protect uh, the people who will work inside from uh, the extremely windy condition, the weather in the North Sardinia. And well, this is the result. And uh, this was quite important because when we realized this, in 2000, between 2008 and 2009, this was the first uh, building really built in, the, in, a, in, a, in relation to the sea. But uh, uh, as you probably remember, in, uh, at the beginning of April 2009, uh, a earthquake was uh, destroying part of uh, the territory of L'Aquila in Abruzzi in Italy, which is the central region of Italy. It was a really a, 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 a tragedy for uh, a lot of people who died. And uh, uh, Mr. Berlusconi, who is still here with us, unfortunately, because we, we did our best to cancel his present from Italy, but he is back. But also at that time he was a prime minister and he suddenly decided to move the G8 summit from La Maddalena Sardinia to L'Aquila. And well, it was, uh, was something that totally unexpected and uh, from another point of view was an amazing waste of money because uh, we have spent uh, hundreds of millions to realize that place for the summit and suddenly he moved and in this way he was investing another amount of millions so he in a way doubled the investment the public investor for a summit who was uh, a complete flop like normally happens with the G8s and uh, that point of view was important because for the first time of my life I was uh, witnessing the relation between uh, daily chronicle politics and architecture. And my architecture, who was realized, uh, became one of the cover of uh, daily magazine and uh, wiki magazine in Italy because that change, that idea to move the G8 summit from Sardinia to L'Aquila was considered uh, an attempt to stall money by uh, a very complicated, uh, let me say, internal relation between uh, politicians people who work in the real estate market, the companies who were building in Aquila, uh, in Sardinia. And uh, this, simply to tell you this, there are some uh, uh, um, unpredictable uh, um, occasion to put together politics and architecture. And that what happened with the G8, made me uh, remind remi remembering that uh, some years before this, on the Domus magazine, when I started with the uh, issues of the magazine, I was starting always showing an image, 
and the first page of my series of issues were dedicated to the unpredictable relation between daily chronicle and architecture. That's something of absolutely mysterious, but uh, uh, if we consider what happens sometimes in the neighborhood of uh, very famous architectures, well, that's something of really particular. Uh, this is uh, Villa Malaparte in Capri, for instance. Uh, this is a, a very famous Italian skyscraper designed by Gioponti in Milano, where a small airplane were crashing uh, some weeks after 11th, uh, 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 September 11. And again, you know better than me what I'm thinking. So there is something of mysterious in this uh, capacity of, of a very important architecture or very famous architecture to be exactly where the things happen. And at the same time, there is something of mysterious in the uh, Daily Chronicle that sometimes are, in a way, attracted, like a, a gravitational force uh, towards the place where very famous architecture are uh, burning. as a Colosseum. When we started to work in Marseille, it was in 2003. And uh, uh, I was really uh, trying to, to, to understand how it was possible to establish a good relation between research and design. Uh, I were uh, just uh, back from an experience we had in uh, in Castle, Documenta 10 Castle, which is one of the most important contemporary art event venue in, in, in the world. And we, as a multiplicity group, were presenting in Castle a research trying to describe uh, a shipwreck, a tragedy with more than 280 people who died, uh, which happened in the, um, in the night uh, uh, Natale, come si dice in modo più notte di Natale? Christmas night of 1996 in the south uh, east of Sicily, in the international waters between Malta, Sicily, Greece, and Tunisia. And well, in that night, what happened is that a small boat with uh, more than 200 uh, refugees coming from uh, Sri Lanka that wanted to arrive on the coast of Sicily, uh, was uh, uh, crashing with a bigger ship. And uh, suddenly, this small boat with this kind of bodies was uh, going on the down the, the back of the sea. And uh, only five years after, thanks to the courage of uh, an Italian journalist and, and a French uh, photographer that uh, uh, rented a submarine uh, video camera, it was possible to discover the place where the bodies of these 283 refugees uh, were abandoned. And uh, what was uh, more uh, unacceptable that for these six years, the countries that were in a way related to this tragedy were not available to accept, were not uh, that interested to take care of what was happening. They simply were canceling the tragedy for six years. So in Castle, we were interested to describe this tragedy. We did an exhibit, an installation with a two big screen. On one screen, there was a, a sort of uh, real-time description of the tragedy with a vision of, from the satellite of the exact moment of the shipwreck. And on the other screen, uh, there was a vision of the uh, the, 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 the video of the, of the telecamera, of the video camera who were um, exploring the front of the sea in the place where the bodies were at that moment, they were still are now. So from describing all this and gathering the witnessing of the people, we were starting to sing to the Mediterranean Basin with, in a, with another perspective. We, you know well that there is a very famous 
a very famous uh, historian, French historian, who was used to call, uh, to describe the Mediterranean uh, like uh, the place of uh, where the different cultures, the different religions, the different tradition are used to cross, are used to mix, are used to create some uh, new uh, steps together. Uh, well, what I think is that if we want to, to sum up the condition of contemporary Mediterranean, we have to, to start from another point of view. And the point of view is to describe a, a liquid continent which is becoming more and more a, a, a solid sea. A solid sea which is crossed by routes which are hyper-specialized, those routes for military, routes for marines, routes for tourists, routes for immigrants, clandestine immigrants, and they, in a way, never cross. So when you enter in one of the routes, you, you have one identity, and you cannot change your identity at the end of your, of your path. And uh, you can never meet people which are using another identity. So this idea of a solid sea was a very important for me, because when I started to think to an architecture in Marseille, you know, I think you know Marseille. Marseille, probably like Barcelona, like Genoa, like Naples, are it's a it's a sponge city. So a city who was always been capable to absorb uh, population groups coming from all over the world, and basically from the Mediterranean basin. I were really, uh, let me say, obsessioned by this idea of an architecture that should start to be open to the sea, who should change its relation to the sea, not simply giving just shelters, like it normally happens with uh, uh, building new building uh, on the waterfront, on the edge of the, of the water. So I started to imagine an idea, a concept of architecture that should, in a way, host the sea, so it should be open to the flows, should symbolically capable to, see, to tell to the Marseille citizen that that is a city which is interested to be open to the flows coming from the Mediterranean, the other Mediterranean countries. And this idea was starting to the idea to have a, a building uh, with a presence of water which should not be an ornamental presence, but a substantial presence of the water. So uh, the first concept that we were designing for, the, for, the, for, the, for Marseille was exactly this, so the idea of uh, a, a, a building with a C cross-section, with two parallel horizontal uh, space and one vertical space, and then the sea entering, not a swimming pool, a sea entering in the middle of the two. And this is something that you are, we are used to see in other, uh, let me say, historical Mediterranean space. From another point of view, we were really thinking to the fact that this, let me say, intermediate space, known by the water of the sea, should become a, a, a public space, a collective space, a, a pro-center space. And that's uh, more or less the concept of the competition. And I have to be very honest, when I started to work on it, uh, I immediately met uh, uh, the president of the region, uh, which is still now, which is Michel Bozel, who is someone who immediately understood my idea. And uh, that's another point that uh, is uh, related with the relation between politics and architecture. I think that when you work as an architect and you want to develop uh, a radical concept, it's normally necessary to establish a strong relation with uh, a politician. And strong relation means that you cannot simply, um, you cannot simply trust on the capacity of the politician to understand. You have to uh, make these politicians, these people, part of your project, part of your idea, part of your concept. And this is exactly what happened in Marseille. So uh, to be very honest, uh, this project was extremely radical, as you can see. But uh, uh, the, 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 the project was capable to overcome uh, several troubles. Uh, for instance, in 2004, just uh, one year after the competition, the project was stopped. And the reason was that uh, nearby this project, there was another huge 
building dedicated to the Mediterranean basin, to the history, is a museum of the Mediterranean, Le Museum, who, would, who has been designed and realized thanks to the presence of another architect, a French architect, Rudy Ricciotti. And for many years, from 2004 to 2008, uh, there was a sort of uh, reciprocal um, censor in terms of that uh, uh, for many uh, of the polit of local politicians it was not possible to imagine that uh, uh, our building and Rudy Ricciotti's building could be developed together for political reason because uh, our building was uh, uh, in a way run by the region which is normally traditionally um, run by left-wing parties and uh, Rudy Ricciotti's building in the museum was run by the municipality who was run by right wing party. So for uh, four years, uh, this project was completely stopped. Uh, at a certain moment, uh, Rudy Ricciotti and me, we, this, we understood that it was impossible to imagine that one building would be built without the other. And we were capable to convince the mayor and the president of the region that it was necessary to start together and to realize it to build it together. But uh, to add something again, which has to relation with this, this, uh, this big event syndrome, is that uh, uh, the, we, we understood that uh, the building were going to be realized only when Marseille won uh, the role of capital of culture 2013. And at that moment, we understood that it was, let me say, uh, possible to build uh, this kind of building. The building is very simple as for trust. And uh, from a structural point of view, it's at the same time uh, uh, extremely uh, complex, but uh, 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 with a quite simple idea and concept. Uh, the skin is done with precast uh, concrete panels, which are surrounding all the horizontal facades and the two vertical facades. And this skin is done in a way to leave the possibility, thanks to uh, some uh, linear glasses, to be transparent, to, to allow someone who is working on the uh, uh, underground uh, space to see what is happening through the water on the cantilever, which is a very particular cantilever. It's a 40 meter long uh, cantilever, inhabited cantilever. And the construction was amazing. It was uh, really, for me, an amazing, amazing experience. Started in uh, 2011, 2010, 2011. And you, see, you can see very well from this picture by Ivan Ban how was the construction. And the construction was like a, from a school of how it's, pos how it's possible to build something which is not simply civic architecture, which is not simply a, a harbor engineer and which is not simply an offshore platform but uh, in a way it's something which is an oscillation between all these three uh, construction processes that's an image of the level which is below the, of the sea as a whole the construction of the staircase into to the new space and those are images of the building. And while the building was uh, um, inaugurated some uh, weeks ago, that's a relation between the two buildings that I think is our, uh, also from that point of view, was, uh, was uncertain. The relation was uh, difficult to decide how to uh, calculate and the the correspondences of these two buildings, but finally I'm quite happy of this result because in a way the two buildings are absolutely different, as uh, but they are they have a certain uh, complementary dimension. It's not only by the dimension of the two buildings. This is the water entering the hall. And uh, what you really appreciate, that's, uh, that's the staircase of, from the hall down to the cantilever. You can see here well the relation between the two spaces. And uh, this is the cantilever, which will be uh, an exhibition space. And you see here the glasses, which allow us to see what is happening. And from the other place, you can see the other part. The 
this is a theater, uh, the 400 people theater, which is uh, below. See? And uh, the building was open and inaugurated by Martin Schulz. Martin Schulz is the president of European Parliament. And uh, what happened also, this is an unbelievable coincidence between the, let me say, the, the starting of this project, the uh, fact that they were in that moment obsessioned by this time to work on a new conceptualization of the Mediterranean basin, and the fact that the building was opened by, by Martin Schulz, who invited all the president of the parliament of all the Mediterranean countries together with the president of the parliament of European parliament for a first summit, and uh, was was really great, let me say, to, 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 have, to have this kind of uh, inauguration in that moment. Uh, for a reason that you can very well understand, and uh, for was uh, like a, a, a another mysterious way to 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 see the coincidence and uh, some sudden coincidence between politics and uh, uh, architecture. Now the building will start to have a autonomous life, and uh, what. Uh, uh, I hope will happen is that uh, not only it will work as an exhibition space or a space for congress, for conference, lecture, and so on, but also like a, a, a place for, for uh, like uh, for workshops and involving uh, students and researchers on the on the on the perspective of geopolitics of Mediterranean from different uh, countries of the world. Uh, I move to another city and let me say to another context this is a book i have just finished to write or better i write two years ago but uh, a, con with a bit of uh, uh, books who host uh, many of the projects that have developed on milano milano is my city where i have uh, born i have my family i have my office i have studied i'm teaching and i have started to do politics and well uh, in this case uh, we were discussing today with vincente emmanuel how it's important to consider the relation nowadays between three main spheres the urban sphere, the natural sphere, and what we normally call agricultural sphere, but we can call also rural sphere. So, if we observe all the, what is happening in the main European cities, we are observing state of transitions between these three spheres. There are parts of the territory that are moving from a natural to a rural condition, part of the territory that are moving from a rural to an urban from an urban to a natural, from an urban to a, a rural condition. So I think it's very important nowadays for, for an architect, for an urban planner, for a politician to understand what is happening and try to orient these transitional processes. So and uh, through what is happening that you, when you, when you are uh, work as a politician or as an architect, sometimes you have the possibility to really run, to orient these processes. Uh, well, this happened to me when I uh, started to be invited uh, to design a concept for Expo 2015. I was part of a group together with Jack Herzog, uh, Ricky Bardet, William McDonough, and uh, another person who was very important for all of us was Carleen Petrini, who is the president of Slow Food. Maybe you know what Slow Food is. It's a, a sort of a Italian international company who is working and trying to evaluate the condition of food in Italy. And uh, the idea as a concept was uh, to give every country the possibility to demonstrate in the six months of the Expo how they deal the relation between agriculture and transformation of agricultural products into foods. So the idea was to have a, a very simple scheme uh, with the perpendicular, uh, um, let me say, logic, and giving to each country, poor or rich, the same space, the same plot, in order to uh, put in evidence the techniques, the technology, and in other cases, like in the case of the poor countries, the biodiversities on the vegetable dimension. 
as a part of the pavilion, so we didn't want to have pavilions, we wanted to have a, a something that should become a sort of a planetary botanic garden, planetary botanic garden, also because we were thinking that the idea to have a planetary botanic garden is something of really new, it's something that can, in a way, uh, give a sense to the experience uh, of uh, visitors coming from China, from Canada, from Australia, from all the world. What happens normally with, uh, with uh, big events like Expo, like in Zaragoza three years ago, that uh, all you are really uh, capable to create something of completely new, who can give a new experience, otherwise they become uh, some uh, version of uh, quite traditional uh, commercial fear, and they are not capable really to give this personal individual experience, and they are flops. So, what is happening in Milano is uh, uh, that we are now in the middle of uh, discussion and uh, there is a possibility that uh, our concept will be completely abandoned and that instead of our botanic garden what will be built will be something much more similar to a very traditional commercial fear. But that's another relation between politics and architecture. And uh, another thing that uh, uh, we started to, 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 to run uh, some years ago was uh, the project of, uh, let me say, two towers in the center of Milano, uh, where we had the idea to, uh, let me say, to take the possibility to have a high number of trees and vegetable components, uh, but in a vertical dimensions. Uh, I was in Dubai when uh, the developer of this place was asking me to imagine how to deal with the towers. And uh, we were discussing with uh, Alejandro Zaera the, the fact that 60% uh, of uh, tall buildings in skyscraper have been built uh, in the last uh, decade all over the world. And the 80% of this 60% are covered by glass skins. And uh, we were, let's be considering the paradox of glass skin that normally are not the best material in order to, uh, let me say, to work with uh, climatic excursion because internal and external spaces. And well, I was starting to think the, possi the possibility to have uh, organic and vegetable facades, uh, but not only as ornamental presences, but really uh, 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 facades. Uh, and uh, not only using plants or shrubs, but imagining to have real trees. And this could have some good uh, effects also on, on sustainability, because uh, the presence of leaves are um, protecting from uh, the summer sunlight, uh, and in winter time, when the leaves are falling, it, they lead the sunlight entering the internal apartments. Uh, leaves are absorbing uh, the dust, the molecular dust of pollu urban pollution. This can create uh, trees and create oxygen. But not only this, I think the idea was really to imagine to have the equivalent of one hectare of forest in the center of a city, in a very small place. In a way, imagining also possible substitution of uh, the normal condition of sprawl or single family houses which are happening all around our cities. And another point was that the, 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 the idea to have uh, real trees and leaves uh, at every floor of these two towers could also Im produce a, 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 mobile, a, a, a mutant landscape that has to change and will change season by season. But what was important was uh, that to, to deal with some uh, absolutely new troubles. For instance, we started to work with a staff uh, of an interdisciplinary staff uh, composed by botanists, structural engineers, wind um, engineers, because we uh, had first to imagine to have uh, um, slabs capable to keep the weight at the, at the perimeter of every floor. Um, determined by the heaviness of the of uh, the terra. Yes. La terra. 
of the earth. Yeah, not of the earth, it's uh, of the soil, of the ground. And then we have worked a lot also, it's, it's a sort of pre-compressed slab in concrete, but at the same time we have worked a lot on the nature of this uh, ground, because it had to be uh, less heavy of natural uh, soil, ground, no, it's not that's land, uh, sorry, uh, soil, no, it's not here too, anyway, less heavy than normal soil, but not too light, because otherwise the roofs of the trees uh, will not have uh, the pressure, the necessary pressure to keep the roof in that place in uh, windy conditions. So it was important to develop a, a very specific mixture, uh, a very specific chemical component for the, for the, for the soil. At the same time, we worked a lot uh, to, to test the release of the tree to the wind. And uh, we have checked this in a, in a wind corridor in, in Florida, uh, just to uh, select a certain number of species who were capable to resist to the, the very different windy condition that we had at the different floor and on the different facade of the two towers. So we are uh, great and uh, extremely interesting to try to solve all this. Another point that we have uh, developed was uh, um, uh, the idea of how to, to manage with the maintenance of the, of the more than 800 trees from 3 to 9 meters that are hosted by the two buildings. And that uh, after a long discussion, we understood that you need the possibility was to have a centralized station on the two towers who will more or less run all what will happen in terms of uh, maintenance, uh, uh, irritation, and so on of the, of the different trees. But basically, every tree was selected in relation with the place, with the sun explosion, with the height, with the humidity condition, with the windy condition. So we work at the really designing part of the facade of these two towers with this kind of concept. Basically, the, the structure of the building is very, very simple. Uh, in a way, it's absolutely a stupid structure. But what was interesting was to design the skin. And the final effect uh, uh, is something that will change, will grow. But uh, uh, what I think will, uh, will be uh, quite interesting in the future of Milano. Now I'll show you more or less what is happening. What was a, it is a quite successful experience because from a certain point of view it's the first case of uh, uh, 900 trees between two towers in the core of a metropolitan environment. And uh, I'm showing you what is happening because there is a forest in the suburb of Milano where we started to cultivate uh, these 800 trees two years ago, or better, three years ago. And uh, since last uh, September, we started to move trees by trees from this, uh, let me say, artificial forest uh, to the site uh, construction. So you can see the trees have di very different dimensions. And uh, this is the way how you are controlling uh, the trees growing uh, with a, already a certain dimension of the roots. Because the plots on the building are one meter twenty high and one meter ten large, that's the preparation of the plots. I like a lot this picture because it's in a way showing the opposition between the concept of uh, facade on tall buildings. It's like a manifesto in itself. That's a, an image which shows also what will happen, but it's in a way absolutely unpredictable because if you want 
it's evident that uh, the trees of uh, uh, one family will occupy the space of the family which is habiting above. So will be probably cover the panorama and the window of uh, of uh, someone who will inhabit in the uh, in the um, nearby apartment. So I think that this three-dimensional complication, the presence of leaves of trees, will probably create some uh, some troubles. But that's also something that I, in a way, extremely worried to consider, but also extremely curious to observe. That's uh, something that happens when you do something of, of in a way, new. That's a, for instance, idea that you have the trees of the neighbor who is coming in your, on your, on your, you know, entering the perspective, if you like. So I think we will ha have to wait until uh, uh, the end of 2014 to have a, a, an idea of how all this vegetable world will uh, covering this to this building. Okay, and uh, the last thing that I want to tell you is something which is much more related to my political activity, only 10 minutes. Uh, I, as I told you at the beginning, I stopped suddenly to, do, to work as a politician, to work as a councillor for culture in Milano. And this happened because I had a very strong discussion, uh, let me say discussion, but it was much more hard, with the mayor of the city. And one of the reasons of this, uh, discussion was a project that I was running as a councillor. And this project is about uh, the idea to move a very, very famous and, let me say, uh, unknown sculpture that we host in Milano. We host in Francesco in the medieval castle uh, located in the center of the city. Uh, I'm not sure you know this. Uh, uh, this sculpture is a sculpture by Michelangelo. And uh, it's called Pietà Rondanini. Uh, it's an amazing sculpture. It's a sculpture that Michelangelo constructed uh, until three hours before dying in 1564. And uh, he worked on that on the last uh, three years of his life. And uh, like it happened in for also for other Michelangelo's sculptures. This is an incomplete sculpture. It's not unfinished, it's incomplete. Uh, at a certain moment of his life, Michelangelo started to consider the possibility to realize uh, art pieces that exactly because they are incomplete, they could communicate with a different potentiality than a, a complete configuration, formal configuration. And the Petaron Dalini is a really a, an amazing sculpture because uh, it has some parts which are uh, completely finished in the details and other parts, like um, shelter of the skin, of the two bodies which are uh, left in this condition. And if you compare this to the other, to Pietà, designed by Michelangelo, which is the most new Pietà, uh, in Roma, who uh, designed for was created by Michelangelo when he was 20, and uh, you can see it's unbelievably strong and it's formally uh, precise and uh, with uh, an enormous sophistication in the details. And what is so uh, strong in this sculpture is the uh, age of the mother and uh, the son, which are the same age. And this is the other Pietà hosted by the old woman Florence, where Michelangelo is also representing himself behind the Jesus Christ dying. But uh, uh, these are the two Pietà. Uh, Pietà Rondanini is another story. And uh, it's another story because uh, I think from a certain point of view, we started to understand the powerful of this culture only in the last years. Only thanks to Moore, only thanks to Rodin, only thanks to Medardo Rosso, I mean, artists who were occupying an important space in the 20th century history of art, 
we now understand the, the powerful of this culture, of the Michelangelo's culture. But uh, what I want to show you, it's a reason I, I was discussing with the mayor, because I wanted to move the sculpture when the place where it is now. The sculpture was bought by the Milan municipality just after the war. And the sculpture was abandoned in a private villa in Roma, just to tell you how it was considered like a sort of diversion. But uh, uh, when I started to work as a councillor, and uh, I understood that uh, this was a, a shame, because nobody knows that in Milano we have this amazing sculpture. And what is amazing in the sculpture is that uh, uh, the relation between the mother and the son is completely different from the other Pietà. Uh, from an, some side, you, you have the, 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 what you, what you, the idea is that uh, it's the mother who is kicking its arms the Jesus, the son. From another perspective, is the Jesus Christ who is keeping on this shelter, the mother. And if you move around this change, just to tell you how important was this concept of incomplete sculpture, because it's working on the ambiguity of the message in order to restore the complicity of the visitor. It asks all of us, it asks all of you to project what you think is the relation between the mother and Jesus. And this is something which has to do with the dimension of Secor. Well, all this wall and this uh, located in a, in, a, in a niche at the end, as a peripheral, in a peripheral room at the end of, uh, of the Museum of uh, Sculpture in the medieval castle in Castel Francesco in Milano. And uh, this decision, you see the sculpture is behind this wall. And well, this decision who in a way is heightening the sculpture. So uh, it, we have not visitors, only only Japanese that will come with because they know that it is there. So uh, was uh, the effect of a project designed by BBPR. BBPR, BBPR are a very famous uh, group of architects who in Milano just after the war started to design some important masterpiece like Torre Velasca. And PPR were asked that in uh, the 50s to design this place for La Petalum Danini. And they were intervening, and I just should want to show you, because we are normally considering that uh, Italian architects in the 50s and the 60s were, let me say, light, sophisticated, elegant uh, uh, designer of uh, uh, um, exhibition spaces. But uh, we probably don't know that sometimes this lightness was not exactly lightness. In this case, what BPR were doing, it's uh, first start to imagine how to put the sculpture in that space. And uh, it's interesting to see how they were working, uh, doing sequence of installations, of real one-to-one -one installation of the space. So the, the data rendering, they have not the possibility to, to create images uh, uh, which were capable to represent the future, so they were simply doing the future. Uh, there are two versions. In this case, uh, in one case, uh, the, the sculpture is located between these two walls. One is uh, wood and the other one, but all this is, as you can see, are models. And on, the, on another uh, version, they wanted to have a, a sort of intermediate roof, which in a way giving the sensation of an openness when you are get closer to the sculpture. But uh, what is important to, uh, to, to discover for me was that uh, BBPR accepted to destroy part of a medieval world that was uh, uh, below the pavement of the room. It was really something that probably we would never accept nowadays, but nobody will never accept nowadays. So in reason of all this, I was really convinced to, to the necessity to move the Michelangelo Pietà in another place. And this is also because uh, the situation of the sculpture nowadays is not the situation who was uh, designed by BBPR that you see here, but it's much more complex because uh, of several superfetation, because of different interventions, who has really transfigured the space. So uh, 
what I've done, I started to consider a new, a new place for, for this culture, and I found a place in the same castle, uh, in, a, in a part of the castle who was uh, used uh, uh, in 1571 as a local hospital for Spanish soldiers, uh, for Plague, because there was a Plague in Milan at that moment. And uh, this was a place uh, who mysteriously were capable to survive to any kind of uh, intervention. And we discovered it this summer. And uh, it is like it was, in a way, with all the history of the time. And this is an attempt to, to move a copy of the sculpture, to, to test the pattern of the sculpture in a, in a different space. And what is important in this case is the picture of Bob Dylan, who went with me to visit the, the, the sculpture, is to show how the dimension of the speed around the sculpture allow you to consider the ambiguity of the sculpture and the strange compass relation between the two bodies. But this is not all. Uh, we had uh, to wait for the renovation of this new space uh, for one year. And so I decided to, to do something that probably extremely strong, who was to move temporary the sculpture in a, in a place who the mayor were considering absolutely wrong. And this place is a, a Milanese uh, jail. It is in the center of Milan, the San Vittore jail. And San Vittore jail is a typical panopticon uh, structure. Uh, uh, you know, Bentham, you know, I was born, this idea of this concept of panoptical view with, in which every uh, prisoner uh, should be observed and controlled by one person who stay in the center, in the core of the structure. And uh, well, uh, uh, you probably don't know, but the condition of uh, of prisons of jails in Italy are extremely bad. Let me say unacceptable. And uh, San Vittorio is hosting three times more the number of prisoners that normally you have to accept. It's a very bad hygienic condition. So the idea to have in the center of the of the, of, of the prison uh, for six months, La uh, Petà uh, di Michelangelo, was, in my opinion, a very strong way to uh, reverse the logic of the gaze. In this case, uh, the, the, the attraction of the sculpture is not, uh, uh, let me say, working on the dimension of control, of surveillance in the Foucault concept, but it's more the opposite. So it's the presence of the sculpture will be attract the gaze from all over the world toward Milano and towards the jail. And in this way, it will attract the attention of the media on the so uh, desperate condition of our uh, prisons. And this was one of the reasons of, uh, of uh, the discussion with the mayor and uh, one of the reasons of uh, my dismission as a councillor for culture. And this is the book in which I have written all this. Thank you so much. If uh, I can start, because I, I have a little question for you. A question, in, in fact, is uh, linked with this idea of ambiguity of points of views of the uh, Pietà. In fact, uh, I was thinking uh, uh, about your amazing projects and uh, your fantastic uh, uh, lecture. And I was thinking about this ambivalent relation between uh, political relations, innovating ideas and projects, and volunteer of diffusion and communications of the ideas. And I think that this is very linked with some of uh, our metabolic, metabolic experiences. And sometimes we have been uh, very criti criti criticized crit criticado, um, by, uh, uh, by a strange or purist, or a very purist or resisting intelligentsia. Uh, with a kind of, that we were accused, or we were, that they say, 
that you are a kind of fresh collaborationist. Um, uh, you are a kind of cynic collaborate, uh, collaborationist with the system, with the neoliberal system. And for me, this was very strong because I am, I believe that in fact we are very idealistic and very pragmatic at the same time. And this is a kind of paradox. It's a kind of ambiv ambivalence that we have in probably in these new generations of ideas. We, are ra we have a radical attitude. We have a lot of buildings that are absolutely radical as in, 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 in the terms, in the terms of, also in the historical terms of radicality. At the, same time, at the same time, they want to uh, operate in the reality. And at the same time, they want to qualify it, to, be, to do better the reality. And this is a strange situation, a very strange situation of this generation, I think. The, this volunteer to operate and to be critical at the same time, to be idealistic, no? Idealistic and realistic at the same time. And uh, I think there, in the, your lesson, was absolutely clear, this idea. Uh, I want to be in politics. I want, I want to be in the communication of the ideas, not only in the journalism, in the communication, in the celebration of the ideas. I want to project, and at the same time, uh, I want to be creative, to be innovative, and at the same time, I must be operational. How to do all this? How to be, how to be infiltrated in the system, and at the same time, how to remove in a critic, with a critical way the system? I think this is incredible. This is very, very clear in your attitude. At the end, also this last uh, uh, experience is very uh, uh, clear in this uh, situation. And I was, I don't know. Uh, my question is, who, what do you think about this situation, this strange situation of our generations? It was, I think, it was in fact, it has been, it has been, it has been um, generous and at the same time. Uh, not alternative, how to explain. I think you are, you are totally right. I think that uh, uh, radicality is uh, it's something that you, you, you learn to run uh, gradually. Mm. And uh, radicality is also uh, at the beginning of a series of uh, unsuccessful. Mm. For me, it was was really. Uh, if I I could describe my my last uh, ten years of a sequence of uh, of mistakes and uh, crashes and not successful, because in a way, the G8 experience was an, from a certain point of view extremely radical, but uh, uh, it didn't work. And from another point of view, uh, Expo was a success because uh, we were trying to do something that was not accepted at the end by the politicians. They were using us because we were, we were, let me say, giving them an idea who was at the beginning extremely smart, cool, used very, very useful to convince people that uh, they were going in the right direction, but finally they were transfiguring our idea and abandoning it. So it was an unsuccess. And from another point of view, this is also an unsuccess. So uh, I, I think that when you, when you start to run uh, radicality, you have to be aware that you are going the, in a, in a, in a, you are entering in a sphere where success and unsuccess are uh, frequent. And unsuccess more than success, probably. But at the same time, uh, I think it was. Because uh, that's our, that is the most uh, uh, interesting part of our our life as architects. Now that uh, if we don't innovate, uh, well, there is a part of our let me say of our soul which is not uh, satisfied. No, I don't know what to think. So uh, it's a very important question because from another point of view. I think that you, when you have to innovate, when you are innov innovating something, you can never be completely an outsider. This is very important. Uh, uh, you have to uh, know the procedures. You have to know the expectation of the people who will decide what you are proposing. So from that point of view, you have to be an insider. But uh, 
it's uh, that kind of radicality. So they have to accept your radicality, and then you have to find someone which works with you, who is uh, available to share this radicality. And that was happening for me with Marseille. And as I told you, in that case, the governor of, 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 of the region were totally sure with me the concept, and we are right in the end. Uh, Berlusconi was not accepting that. When Berlusconi came to see what I was designing for the summit, he was completely shocked and said, well, but this is not the space that I wanted for, for meeting Obama and, and, uh, and Sarkozy. And uh, because, because uh, um, I prefer to have uh, uh, a more ornamental place, uh, so we started to discuss, and uh, I understood immediately that there was something that would never work. And finally, it didn't work because he didn't like the space. He didn't feel the space, his space, the space for ceremonial about geopolitics and uh, its role as a politician, international politician. So that's another point. But when you are an insider, or but uh, using radicality, you can become suddenly an outsider. And well, I think it's uh, at different scale is always. Same, because when you work uh, for a design an apartment, you have to deal with a client. More or less the same thing. You have to know him quite well. You have to be a psychologist from a certain point of view. You have to decipher his needs, his expectations, his dreams, his nightmares. But at the same time, if you simply follow him, you, you lost, you, do, you, you are not uh, doing your work. You, are, you, know, you have to always to introduce something of radical in what you are doing. Questions? Uh, thank you for the lecture. It has been really nice to see um, projects of different scales. Uh, I think that it's uh, very interesting and it's something that we are working very much here at the Institute. Uh, I would have many questions that I would maybe do later in the dinner. <laughs> uh, the, green, the Green Tower is an, is an amazing project. It's a, quite, it's a quite of simple ideas that many of us have designed and we have talked about it, but nobody has really built it. So I think it is really great. Uh, there are, of course, many questions there of how uh, ecology, um, are artificial, let's say, um, uh, artificial squad to quote uh, uh, systems are created, um, but I won't speak about it. Uh, I, will, I would rather speak about um, the projects that they are uh, related with the port, uh, because port is another case study that we have been working here for many years. So I would like to ask you, how do you consider that the port of Barcelona could be reconfigured, and how, how um, um, radical? Um, ideas and radical actions could help us start transforming port cities as the city of Barcelona and how, how we could deal with this kind of heavy infrastructure that usually uh, it represents a section uh, moment and the division moment between the city, let's say, and the sea. So I see that you have a lot of sensibility of how the water and how the sea could really uh, coexist together with um, architectural space and public space. So I would really like to know your opinion on how, how some ideas uh, of this could be applied here in Barcelona or in general what kind of attitude we should have towards this kind of infrastructural areas. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's a very important question. I, uh, I have not one answer. Uh, I think that uh, it's very important to 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 decipher the local condition of every port and every port or city. What normally happens is in Europe, uh, not in East uh, Asia or in uh, North America, is that city and port are, are in a way uh, they they share the same history. You know, they are growing. They grow together and. Uh, uh, normally they share the infrastructure and this for a long period was working but uh, when the containers entered in the virtual sphere they 
was a, was a bomb because I completely changed the techniques and the relation between the docks and the historical center of the cities, no? Because the containers need huge surfaces. And the, the center of our protest city were not capable to give these huge surfaces. Or to give them was, was a, uh, related to the necessity to pull down part of the historical texture tissue of the city. So this happened the, after the Second World War, and the, the 60s and the 70s, but was very important in the 80s. And uh, at that moment, some cities decided to move the commercial port on different areas, like in Barcelona, in Guinea, partially because Guinea has no space, but uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Pirio, in, uh, in Thessaloniki, uh, and Marseille, from part. And what has happened is that uh, uh, at that moment, the city were trying to consider the possibility to uh, go back to a direct relation to the sea. So we uh, con re con conquistare, we say, reacquire a direct relation to the, to the water side, to the waterfront. Uh, that was exactly what happened in, 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 in Genova with Renzo Piano's project for Colombia in 92 and what was happening here in Barcelona. And well, let me say that this, let me say, uh, uh, a mission of the city to uh, um, have a direct relation with the sea and was uh, really great, but uh, sometimes, um, sometimes, sorry, uh, uh, dangerous because uh, there is a kind of, let me say, edulcoration of uh, of the of the nature of the port, which is a very strong, hard, uh, surprising, uh, powerful nature. And uh, I would like to match what I normally see, uh, what I what happened, for instance, in Barcelona with this part. Porto Nuevo, no? Porto Nuevo. Not just after the Olympics, there was this uh, intervention on the port of Barcelona, close to the port, uh, near the center. Yeah. Well, there is. Eh? Sì, quello, quello, quell'intervento nuovo fatto, fatto 10, 15 anni fa, Mare Magno, mezzo that. I sincerely consider all this awful because it cancels the nature of the port. And the port is, uh, uh, the European ports are, um, uh, for the story, are, are heterogeneous and uh, mixed environments. They, they can host uh, housing and uh, leisure and uh, uh, movement of goods and the ships. Uh, so it's not an answer, but just to tell you that there are a lot of risks in all this. Thank you.